Good day. We are starting our CSI, CSI webinar um, right now. We are a little late. We did have some technical difficulties. Um, however, we are now getting started. Thank you for joining our webinar this month. My name is Philip Payne. I am the technical lead for the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, also known as CSI Act. Uh, we are one of the three IAC domains in the DOD Information Analysis Center, and we operate under DTIC, the, the Defense Technical Information Center. Uh, our informative webinar series highlights current and emerging research and technology developments. It presents an opportunity for accelerating the DOD's leverage of these advancements by increasing awareness and fostering technical collaboration. CSI Act um, supports organizations working in cybersecurity, information system science and technology of DOD research and engineering. Uh, we help do this by navigating the vast landscape of scientific and technical information allowing our customers to get a head start on their technical projects. We help provide research and analysis services and help unlock information, knowledge, and best practices from government, industry, as well as academia to stimulate innovation, foster collaboration, and eliminate redundancy. Uh, before we get started today, I just wanna go over a couple of administrative items. First, if you're dialed in uh, by phone and would like a copy of the slides, they are posted to the CSI webinar announcement. You can go to csi.org forward slash webinars and you can find today's webinar. When you click on it at the bottom of the announcement, it will say to view webinar PDF, click here. Uh, secondly, all participants are muted on the line, but feel free to chat using the attendee chat button on the left hand side of the webinar screen. Uh, this will allow you to chat with each other and I will be monitoring that chat as well during the webinar. However, if you have a specific question uh, from one of our presenters. Uh, we will have a Q&A session at the end. So please use the audience questions tool at the top center of your screen. Uh, that icon looks like a little chat bubble and that's right next to the file folder. Uh, so if you wanna post questions for presenters, use that. Uh, if you just wanna talk to other attendees, then use the, the, the attendee chat on the left-hand side. At the end of the presentation, uh, I will go over all questions and answers. Uh, for the benefit of those on the phone, I will read the questions aloud to the presenter. Uh, if you guys have any technical issues during the presentation, uh, have no fear. The full presentation will be available online. You can check back on the CSI website for that. Once the webinar is posted, the go to webinar button will take you to the actual YouTube link. Uh, with that said, I will hand off the presentation to, to Scott to get us started with our webinar this month. Thank you. Well, no, thank you so much, um, Phil, for all the hard work, for the invitation, for making all this happen, and, and welcome, everybody. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here. Uh, we do have a co-presenter, as you see, Chris Hart, former NTSB chairman, and uh, Phil mentioned those technical difficulties. We're still getting Chris on the line. I think he's going to try to dial in in just a moment. We've just been trading emails, so sorry if we're uh, just a little bit distracted, but one way or the other, we'll, we'll have Chris join. Uh, but happy to kick things off. And again, uh, it's just such a pleasure to be here with all of you to discuss this important topic of not only critical infrastructure protection broadly, but what role you know could a national cybersecurity safety board model potentially after the NTSB you know play in that regard? Um, as many of you know, you've been following this closely. I'm sure uh, we have taken some important steps in this direction already, thanks to a Biden administration executive order from the spring setting up the cyber safety. Uh, review board. So not a fully fledged national cybersecurity uh, safety board, as we'll be discussing, but still, now that uh, we have this concept being being stood up, getting some traction, we'll hopefully be able to tease out, you know, some of the benefits and drawbacks as Congress continues to look at this topic uh, with proponents like Senator Warner uh, being increasingly vocal in uh, promoting it. So before we dig into the um, NTSB lessons for cybersecurity, et cetera, just a little bit of context to kind of help frame our discussion here. As all of you know, the vexing issue of defining and protecting critical infrastructure has been you know, front of mind for um, defense professionals, for uh, practitioners, for policymakers for decades at this point. From the federal policy side of things, you know, this really got going starting in the late 90s, particularly with regards to Presidential Decision Directive 63, which set up our very sector specific approach to thinking about and protecting critical infrastructure, the birth of the ISACs. A lot of what we've seen since was really 
you know, the foundation was laid almost 22 years ago now. But still, we're, we're left grappling with some first principles, right? Um, what should we be considering as critical infrastructure? What's the most critical of critical infrastructure? These days, of course, in the U.S., we have 16 of these sectors as designated by DHS. Uh, and we keep adding, uh, including with election infrastructure in 2017. In other parts of the world, as we'll say just a little bit about toward the end, including the European Union, there's seven critical infrastructure sectors as uh, designated by their Network Information Security or NIST directive. And, and these days in the U.S., um, there's distinct advantages to being designated as critical infrastructure with regards to not only regulations, but also access to different information sharing networks, uh, including the ISACs that we'll be talking about. But of course, um, they're not, it's not a panacea. And when we have this degree of our infrastructure um, being designated as critical from healthcare, finance, to water utilities, the grid, public accommodations, et cetera, um, there's that vexing question at the bottom there. If, if everything's critical, is anything? Um, and because we haven't done that difficult um, uh, uh, you know, um, kind of balancing act in a democracy like ours of figuring out, well, what, what really is the most critical um, and putting in, you know, from a strategic perspective, different cybersecurity benchmarks to make sure those those sectors hit outside of some uh, laws like uh, Sarbanes-Oxley and HIPAA, which have been kind of scattershot over the years. So um, they just uh, just a little bit of food for thought to think about um, this, obviously, notion of a national cybersecurity safety board, only one part of this uh, much bigger conversation around critical infrastructure protection, deterring cyber attacks on it. Um, and we'll be talking more about that with regards to some of these leading frameworks to help build out this notion of cybersecurity due diligence, defense in depth, and what role, you know, potentially persistent engagement plays as part of this, um, uh, this discussion as well. Um, so obviously, cyber attacks on critical infrastructure are nothing new, as you can all relate. Uh, we're actually working on a history book right now that does a it's, it's been fun to look back um, at how these have progressed over the decades. But, you know, depending on who you talk to, there's obviously uh, episodes dating back to the 80s, even before of pretty high profile cyber attacks that have destabilized aspects of critical infrastructure. Um, there's the, um, you know, infamous episode, uh, alleged episode of the um, cyber attacks uh, that were uh, hitting the uh, Soviet natural gas pipeline in the early 80s that had, you know, a CIA sponsored logic bombs placed there. There were episodes involving the Morris worm, of course, in 1988, uh, which was, of course, not even um, not even purposeful. You know, Roger you know, said that it, he didn't mean to do this. It, it, it sent a note of apology, not unlike in some ways Dark Side, uh, Dark Side's note. But what uh but with regards to the colonial pipeline earlier this year uh, but what's different of course these days is how quickly these cyber attacks are proliferating i don't need to tell you in terms of numbers sophistication and severity and the fact that they're targeting um companies and countries alike and this is intersecting at the same time with a lot of important trend lines including an ever-expanding attack surface with the internet of things um, and as part of the big push toward investing in new infrastructure um, and smart infrastructure, smart grids, smart cities, um, not only is that, of course, important in combating the worst effects of climate change, but if we don't think of cybersecurity front of mind as these new investments are rolled out, we could be setting ourselves up you know, for a world of hurt and for exacerbating um, this insecurity in the critical infrastructure context for some time. So uh, we've been following, obviously, the discussions happening on the Hill closely. I'm sure all of you have as well in that regard. But the idea is not to have a repeat of something like you know, the Help America Vote Act, which did a lot in 2002 on the benefit side of the ledger, but also you know set us up with some of the insecurity in the voting process that we've been dealing with in 2016 and, um, and thereafter. So that's just a, a bit of additional context. Um, I think Chris might have joined us as well. Chris, is that right? Are you on the line now? Affirmative. Hey, excellent. Excellent. I'm wondering, do you want to just say a quick hello, too, before we move on with the first half here? Yes. <clears throat> Good day, everyone. Sorry, I'm having so much trouble collecting, connecting. The best I'm able to do is by phone, so now you won't get to see my smiling face. Sorry about that. Quite all right, Chris. No, it's a it's an honor to have you join us, regardless of whichever connection we need to do. And um, and and Chris will be filling us in with his 
not only some more stories, but some really helpful, I think, insights from the NTSB context as his long uh, work there and, and otherwise in protecting the nation's critical infrastructure. So we'll be turning to that in just a few minutes here. Um, and I'm realizing, actually, we just jumped in because we started a bit late, but um, we should do some more formal introductions as well. So apologies for not doing that at the outset, guys. But uh, Scott Shackelford, so I'm uh, I'm a professor at Indiana University, obviously, uh, where I also have the honor of chairing our cybersecurity risk management program, directing the Ostrom Workshop, which is a research center focused on governance. Um, and I've been looking at this issue of you know critical infrastructure and cybersecurity in particular uh, for you know about seven eight years um, at this point. My training is as a JD PhD, so it's primarily from a comparative uh, law and policy perspective, as as you'll see as we progress here. But thanks again for joining us, everybody. Um, excellent. And to give you just a few insights for how some of these big trends are you're playing out a bit closer to home, we've been involved in a series of these state level cybersecurity surveys. This is the most recent. This is called the um, State of Hoosier Cybersecurity 2020 report. And we did this with a lot of help and support from the Indiana Executive Council on Cybersecurity under the governor's office, our attorney general's office. Um, and the Secretary of State. And this survey went out to 3,000 plus organizations across Indiana. We got about a 10% response rate. You know, not great, uh, but it could be worse, especially with these cybersecurity surveys. And we found, you know, some interesting things, um, as you see up there. Classic good news, bad news, right? Um, on the good slash disturbing side of the spectrum, 95% of the organizations surveyed were either somewhat or very concerned about cyber risks. Um, and as you see there, there was a bit of a bifurcation with regards to critical and non-critical infrastructure organizations, right? With those organizations that said they were in a critical context, a critical infrastructure uh, context, reporting less, fewer cyber attacks successfully penetrating their networks than those that weren't. Again, correlation. Um, it's hard to say for sure why that's the case. It could be some combination of things, including access to the ISACs, different regulatory requirements, compliance frameworks in play, et cetera. But it's an interesting finding. Just one other one to note as well is that um, there was a little bit of a less of a difference here, but in terms of the proactive nature of mitigating these various threats, and I should say a lot of these data were, take, were collected right before the pandemic really hit last March. So we're in the process now of doing a follow-up survey, uh, which I'd love to share the results for you know, once they're available next year, 2022. And we'll be rolling them out in other states um, across the country as well, starting with Texas and Arizona, so that we can begin doing some of these comparative analyses with regards to the uptake of different cybersecurity best practices and security controls, but also other related risk management tools, including insurance. We asked a lot of questions about cyber risk insurance in Indiana, for example. I was a bit surprised that 60% of the organizations we surveyed already reported having cyber risk insurance. Um, there was a lot of confusion, though, about what was covered, what wasn't covered, what exclusions applied, um, et cetera. And the biggest reason for what it's worth, as you see on the screen here, of why more organizations said they weren't taking more proactive steps is just a lack of clarity, frankly, on where they should be putting that next dollar of investment. Should it be in multi-factor and, and encryption? Should it be in an in insurance scheme um, or a, um, a cyber hygiene training program for their employees? So we had, I think there's a lot more that we can do just from a pure educational standpoint, particularly for the small, medium-sized businesses, uh, including those that happen to be critical infrastructure providers. Okay. Um, so that was just a little bit of context. Digging in now, there's obviously two main ways, as you all are aware, of doing cybersecurity deterrence, whether it's deterrence by denial, this defense in depth strategy, um, or the persistent engagement, or some combination of the two. Um, the NIST cybersecurity framework, of course, came from former President Obama's 2013 State of the Union address um, and was in turn a reaction to previous efforts starting in 2011, which really came to the fore in 2012 to pass one of those kind of quote unquote comprehensive cybersecurity reform bills. This took the form of the Cybersecurity Act of 2012. Uh, which seems like, you know, my goodness, eons ago in terms of both cybersecurity and policy at this point. But the idea at that time was to give DHS responsibility not only for setting 
um, the cybersecurity sectors, all right? So establishing those, but also establishing benchmarks, cybersecurity benchmarks that providers in those sectors would have to hit. And the idea was the, the carrot, if they didn't hit those, but they made a good faith effort, um, then there were liability shields. There were safe harbors in place to encourage the uptake um, of those best practices. That wound up getting filibustered. There were alternative versions, including from former Senator McCain that were proposed that would have put NSA rather than DHS in the driver's seat and made the whole scheme voluntary. But even that didn't make it through. Interesting these days, there is you know, more traction, it seems like, on the Hill. Um, and for that matter, uh, from uh, the private sector to you know, recognizing the need, frankly, for more um, regulations in this context. So we're starting to see those, you know, both from the um, uh, executive side of the ledger with the SEC, uh, 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 including other FTC, but also, you know, uh, we'll see what happens at the federal level. A lot happening at the state level. My goodness, we have a new project coming out shortly based in part on these survey efforts called Defining Reasonable Cybersecurity, which is the state level overview of how states like you know Ohio with their safe harbor law or California with their definition of reasonable cybersecurity, which is pretty much tied to the top 20 CIS security controls, um, how that's playing out, how it's impacting business practices already. And of course, how global developments, including you know GDPR and the NIST directive, are playing into some of those decisions as well. Uh, but this is one of those you know classic approaches. Done a lot, obviously, the NIST cybersecurity framework through various iterations. You know, most recently with you know uh, related efforts around supply chain security, the privacy framework. Even earlier this week, with regards to labeling um, for consumers, in terms of how we can do a better job of communicating privacy and security to for uh, with regards to internet connected devices. So there's a lot of interconnected pieces here, but this is a part of the puzzle. Uh, that's why we asked a lot of questions about it um, in the survey. And it's, an, it's a useful foundation to build upon as we think about what these National Cybersecurity Safety Board and Cyber Safety Review Board investigations could look like as they start to develop a common language um, around risk management, which you know, NIST helps us to do. Okay, with regards to the National Cybersecurity Safety Board concept in particular, this is not a new problem um, at all, and uh, you know, or a new idea for that matter. As you see here, it's been around for at least 30 years at this point. We tracked one of the early references back to a National Research Council report back to 1991, which was in response in part to the Morris Forum that we mentioned uh, just a little bit earlier. And it called for the development of an NTSB for cybersecurity. Um, as Chris will be telling us more about, it's a common refrain, right? When we have a major crisis, um, including the financial crisis to say, hey, we need an NTSB for X or Y. Not always is that a very good or coherent idea. We're going to argue in the cybersecurity context. Um, it obviously, we think, um, could help significantly. But around since 1991, there were different versions of the notion that came out, though, in 2014, a little more fleshed out in this NSF report, which I'd encourage anybody interested um, to take a look at. But even there, only got a few paragraphs worth of treatment. And that's what led me, frankly, to give it a little more scholarly attention in 2018 uh, for an, this was with, with regards to just a law review article that I drafted at the time, uh, which tried to take some lessons from some of the more complicated NTSB investigations, including those involving the Challenger and the Columbia Space Shuttle disasters, since not only did it highlight technical failings, but also those of uh, organizational uh, behavior. Um, corporate governance, supply chain security, a lot of the a lot of the interlinked notions and concepts that are going to have to come to the fore if we're going to do a good job of investigating in a comprehensive manner, you know, attacks like solar winds, etc. Um, we did some more popular outreach in this concept, including a piece for the Wall Street Journal in 2019. And then most recently, this final report hasn't been published quite yet. I wish I could give you a link to it because, in my opinion, it's the most useful um, to date is this 2021 report from the Belfer Center at the Harvard Kennedy School. Um, Chris and I were involved in these efforts and um, they do a good job of, of um, you know, teeing up a lot of the big issues that we're gonna have to figure out if meaningful progress is gonna be made on fleshing out this concept, including deciding, well, what types of cyber attacks um, are gonna need to be investigated? What are those thresholds? Is it numbers of people impacted? Is it the novelty? Um, of the attack, a certain number or type of zero days involved? Um, is it 
the economic damage? Is it certain critical infrastructure sectors that we're going to prioritize here? Um, so those are some of the some of the challenges that are teed up. And if, if you're curious, um, in in this particular report, there were some um, ideas that, of course, reasonable people can and should disagree. That was right around ten and thirty. So right around the notion of at least um, 10 million people or 30 million in damages. But again, my goodness, uh, there was a lot of good debate around what those thresholds should be, which I know is just going to continue. But that's that all sets the stage for the executive order we saw this past spring, right? One of them anyway, with regards to cybersecurity. The, the main relevant piece of it for our purposes is section five. And as you see there, that's the section that sets up this review board. Um, I don't need to read this to you. You see the language. Interestingly, it puts DHS and the U.S. Attorney General's office in the driver's seat for figuring out the composition of that board. Um, as you see, the idea is to have a you know, variety of different stakeholders from the public and private sector involved with different competencies, like we see in an NTSB board, right? Because these folks, as well as Chris is going to tell us about, have to have that background that competence uh, to fulfill these duties. So this isn't just a run of the mill, you know, political appointee. Um, in terms of the, you know, the timeline, the idea is to have stood this up already. There have been some delays, uh, but a lot of the media issues are already being discussed, including some of those notions we just talked about with regards to scope, the responsibilities, and also the timeline for these reports, because NTSB reports, for example, can take a year or more to compile um, to get to reach that comprehensive um, uh, you know, nature of the, and the utility of those reports. In, in this arena, you know, certainly it would be useful to have a comprehensive report on the likes of solar winds a year, 18 months after the fact. But in the meantime, lots of organizations are vulnerable. Um, so with that, that's the balancing act that needs to be thought through here in terms of are there interim steps? Are there a, is there a partnership with CISA, uh, with the DOD, with other organizations which would be useful here in getting out um, some of these core findings quickly and help safeguard uh, you know vulnerable organiza organizations? A um, lot of challenges to think through as well. I don't need to tell you. Uh, political, practical uh, in nature and scope. Um, including, as we said, the types of cyber attacks. Um, we're not going to get to the point of being able to investigate every cyber attack the way we do every you know, airline disaster. Um, nor will this mean that I, I think we could all agree that cyber attacks are going to be, unfortunately, as infrequent right, as we have been able to achieve in the aviation context. But the point here is to, to bend the curve, to have a comprehensive rendering um, of, you know, of what happened so that we don't have to keep you know, hopefully running afoul of these same challenges again and again. Key part of that is gonna be communication, um, including to small and medium-sized businesses of the findings of these reports to, so that they're established either as industry best practices, which often happens in the NTSB context or potentially you know, codified um, at the federal level, of course, and the state level. Um, workforce is another key issue. I don't need to tell you that there's a negative unemployment rate um, in cybersecurity. So, you know, figuring out how to staff these interdisciplinary teams to investigate um, these cyber attacks, uh, that, that, that in itself is a challenge. Um, there could be a service model that we could play with. And I've, I've written up some proposals over the years to establish something like, uh, you know, a cyber peace core building off the AmeriCorps concept. The Digital Fellows Program, I think, is a great step in that direction. So you could, in other words, um, see a model whereby, you know, recent grads serve on these teams for some period of time in return for, for giving loans. And they could, in turn, then bring that knowledge and expertise to their uh, either to the government um, or, or to industry or both. Um, uh, so that could be one model. You could also think about a volunteer model with different, you know, vendors uh, volunteering a certain number of their workforce on a rotating basis, um, or just you know staffing up and hopefully doing more to widen the talent pipeline uh, with programs like CyberCorp. And of course, there's going to be both industry resistance and support, as we've already seen for this concept. We think that there could be some support in particular from the insurance industry, given that this need to establish, you know, reasonable cybersecurity is incredibly important, uh, especially in the critical infrastructure context. We've seen rates going up because of the ransomware epidemic going along with the COVID pandemic. Um, I've been hearing just anecdotally about, you know, uh, for uh, in terms of renewals of these policies, you know, 40 page plus questionnaires about, you know, what they're doing uh, to, with regards to cybersecurity because of those challenges. A lot of practical issues as well when we're thinking about how to share information, uh, both PII and trade secrets, et cetera, confidentially. 
during these investigations of how the teams are going to access, uh, you know, hardware, software in a secure manner. Um, as we said earlier, figuring out the terminology here uh, around risk management, that's a step in the right direction. But there's a lot of other interrelated issues that we need to wrap our arms around. Um, and, and again, figuring out that, that balancing act between having a, a really well-rounded comprehensive report um, and also getting out that needed um, information with some urgency. And you know, lastly, this is just one piece of an important puzzle that we think are complementary with regards to giving us a much better feel um, for how we're doing as a nation with regards to mitigating these various cyber-enabled threats. Um, for example, for a National Cybersecurity Safety Board you know, to be effective, you need to have um, various funnels of information going to it, including with regards to how many cyber attacks, frankly, are happening, how many people they're impacting, what those trends look like. We so far have done this in a really fragmented way in the U.S. with you know 50 different state level data breach notification laws. Now, recently, we know we're starting to have some federal mandates for um, uh, as part of the procurement process for uh, for federal vendors. That's a useful step in the right direction. But this idea that's been around for some time as well of a bureau of cyber statistics, uh, statistics could really be helpful in helping the National Cybersecurity Safety Board figure out what's novel and what isn't, right? What's part of a bigger trend and what's something new that really demands this type of interdisciplinary investigation. Um, so I could go on all day, as you can tell, uh, but I'd love to turn things at this point over to Chris to tell us more about um, how he feels the NTSB uh, analogy and the experience could could play into both directly and indirectly, given that NTSB has authority over things like gas pipelines already, um, into this uh, into this notion of hardening our systems against cyber attacks. So, Chris, without further ado, over to you. And uh, thanks again. Sorry for the technical challenges there. Well, thank you, Scott, and uh, it's a pleasure to work with you on these issues because I'm I'm excited about the potential for an NTSB type of scenario in cyber. And so I'm, I'm excited to have the opportunity to play a role in, in helping make this happen. So if you, if, if you, can you run the slides for me, go to the slide about the NTSB, which is the first slide. I sure, I sure can. Yep. And we're on the, about the NTSB slide right now. Great. So the NTSB is all about, and, and that's my background, by the way, I'm, I'm a transportation safety guy. I, I don't know anything about cyber. So I'm only in this because Scott asked me to see if we can use this model for cyber but but that's my background is transportation safety and i'm a former chairman of the national transportation safety board so what the ntsb does is investigate transportation accidents in all modes we get the most media ink in aviation but we actually do all modes and <clears throat> then we determine what caused those mishaps i mean even pipelines we do that surprised people when we showed up in major pipeline explosions what are you doing here well moving gas and oil is transportation and so the congress decided they wanted us as the transportation safety guys to look at moving gas and oil so we do we do maritime we do highways we do trains we do aviation obviously and so so it's in, in all modes <clears throat> then we make recommendations to prevent that from happening again and our recommendations are are not mandatory and so that the interesting story on that is that even though they're not mandatory about 80 percent of the time our recommendations are followed which to me is a real tribute to the quality of the staff that we have at the NTSB to create such good recommendations that people do them 80% or so of the time, even though they don't have to. <clears throat> we also investigate not just single accidents, but undesirable trends, things that are going the wrong way, and then make recommendations to correct those trends. At this last bullet on this slide, I mentioned as an accredited representative for aviation accidents outside the U.S., because I have to imagine that whoever does this in the U.S. is going to need to have is going to need to be ready to, to be international because cyber respects no borders. So I, these problems that we're having are around the world. And, and, and I just let you know that the NTSB, uh, by, by congressional mandate, is our accredited representative for aviation accidents outside the U.S. and we'll need to have a structure like that in cyber. Next slide, please. Advantages of independent investigator. There are only two industries that have an independent investigator. This was one, transportation. The other one is for plant explosions, they have the Chemical Safety Board. The, the problem is that most of the time in most regulated industries, and I know that's not this one yet, but stay tuned because I imagine sooner or later it's going to be regulated. But most regulated industries, when something goes wrong, the regulator is the one who does the investigation. The problem with that is a lot of times 
things that the regulator does or does not do are links in the chain to the mishap. And the question is, will those regulator links in the chain appear in the, in the report? Chances are, no, they will not. But when we do it, since we're independent, we don't have a dog in the fight, then <clears throat> things that the regulator did or did not do are also in the report. And that's part of the reason we're so world-class is because we are independent and we, that's how we produce our unbiased and impartial investigation results. So in, in every industry we do, in every transportation mode we do, there are more, regulation, more recommendations to the regulator than to any other single entity, just to show you how important that, that independence is. Next slide, please. History and evolution. The aviation is what scares people the most. People are, a lot of people are afraid of flying. And so that's what scares people the most. They've been, they've been in investigating aviation accidents for many, many decades, first under the Department of Commerce when, when they first started it. But when, when all of the modes of transportation were, were put in, the, in a regulatory function under one roof in the Department of Transportation, they decided they were going to put all of the accident investigations under one roof as well. And that's when the NTSB, in its former, in its former uh, way the, of doing business with the Department of Commerce, only aviation, that's when NTSB started looking at all the other modes of transportation was when DOT was created in 1967. So, so they created NTSB to, to look at all the modes that, the, that DOT covers. Didn't take long to realize that if NTSB was part of DOT, which they were in 1967, that we were going to be in the embarrassing, awkward situation of sending recommendations to our boss, which was DOT. As I said, more recommendations go to the regulator than any other entity in the industry. So, so the, they realized that's kind of awkward. So they made NTSB completely independent. So now it does not report to DOT any longer, basically reports to Congress. And and so that, that was a, a lesson learned was, you know, if you make recommendations to your boss, that just ain't going to work. So that's why we were separated and made independent in 1974. Next slide, please. So how did that happen? They did several things. There are a lot of unique aspects of the law that help us be independent. One is party balance. The, the, the agency has five members nominated by the president, confirmed by the Senate, but only three of the five can be of the president's party. So the intent there is obviously to have some party balance. So it's not a Democratic thing or a Republican thing. We are insulated from, from political lobbying forces. And, and the way they do that is because we are appointed to fixed terms rather than serving at the pleasure of the president. Most political appointees serve at the pleasure of the president. What that means in the real world is that they do something politically embarrassing, they're probably out of there. And we've seen that happen many times. But in my case, I, I was, I'm a term appointment. So the way it works is with five members, they have five year terms and one expires at the end of each calendar year. So <clears throat> if, if there's a big investigation going on and one of the parties is very powerful and doesn't like the way the investigation is heading because it looks like it's starting to, to target them, if you see what I'm saying, then they can't come to me and say, if you don't move this, you know, if you don't redirect this effort so that it doesn't point at me, but it points at labor or the manufacturer or the operator or somebody else besides me, then I'm going to go to my buddy, the president, and get you thrown out. Well, that can't happen because I'm there for a fixed political term. So if I do something politically embarrassing, I'm just there. I'm going to be a political embarrassment until the end of my term. And that's to, again, insulate us, the, the members from political lobbying forces. There's also a knowledge requirement. That's very rare too for political appointees. You could be the head of name, name the head of the Department of Labor and not know how to spell labor. But in, in in our law, we at least three of the five have to have some relevant knowledge, and that's that's very unusual for political appointees to have a substantive requirement. Our five-year terms are staggered, as I mentioned, and the advantage of that is it provides institutional continuity, and it also means that a new president can't just replace everybody wholesale. The president can only replace the people whose terms have expired. So, so the reason for this independence is it helps ensure that what we find in terms of the probable cause and what we recommend in terms of how to prevent that from happening again are based on the facts and not influenced by lobbying or undue influence of any kind. Next slide, please. Impetus for extraordinary stat statutory independence. Well, because as I said, a large percentage of the public is afraid of flying and guess who flies a lot? All of the federal all the federal leg legislators, all of our congressmen and senators fly a lot between DC and their home districts. So, so of course they're gonna make the laws friendly to improving safety because they use aviation a lot. 
people, a lot more people die on the roads than in, in aviation, 100 people every day on the highway, but yet an airplane can slide off the end of the runway, people go down the slide and sprain some ankles, and it's national news for three days, whereas 100 people a day dying on the highway doesn't get any attention at all. So, so it's all because I think people feel that they have more control when they're driving. When they jump in a aluminum tube, go 35,000 feet at 500 miles an hour, they, they have zero control, whereas they feel like when they're driving, they have complete control. And that's, that's part of that fear of flying is people have no control. So, so that, that's the reason that, that that's, that's what underlies our statutory independence, which, has been, which is, again, is the reason that we are considered a world-class investigation agency. Next slide, please. We're also separated from litigation. So th that, that I thought was a very astute move on the part of Congress to separate us from litigation. So the way they do that is the facts that we find are all public and they're on the website and anybody can find them. But our analysis, which, it, which shows up in our ultimate reports on the accident, our analysis is not admissible in court. And that was, that was very ingenious on the part of the legislators at the time to make us not link to, to to litigation because what they didn't want was our investigators to be worried about, wow, if this comes out, such and such a company is going to be out of business. They don't want them to be thinking about those kinds of things. They want them to, to face solely what are the safety issues and what can we do to address the safety issues. And, and to that point, by the way, when we make recommendations, the recommendations are there. We do not do, the Congress did not want us to do cost benefit analysis. So what, what Congress wanted from us was, what would you do from a safety standpoint in the ideal safety world? where safety is your only consideration. And of course, that's never the case, but that's what they wanted from us is, if safety were your only consideration, what would you do in, in, to, to improve safety? That's why that 80% number doesn't trouble me. A lot of people say, why, if people only do 80% of your recommendations, why not mandate your recommendations and they'd have to do 100% of them? To, to me, that would be a big mistake and I'm opposed to that notion because the, the concept of us having being safety only means that we're going to have a different perspective than the rest of the world who is not safety only. So if, if people actually did what we recommended 100% of the time, then I would be concerned that either we are, we are not safety only enough or the people who are implementing aren't considering the rest of the factors they have to consider other than safety. Conversely, if, we, if, our, if only 60% of our recommendations were followed, I'd be concerned that people aren't doing it enough. So most safety experts say that 80%-ish is about the healthy range for where, where we would want people to be doing what we recommend. So we do our accidents in two phases. Start with a factual phase and, and then we go to an, an analytical phase. The factual phase is where we're gathering all the facts to determine what happened and the reason we need the support of all of the parties. So if there's a big airline crash, <clears throat> the parties would include the airline would be a party, the pilot's union would be a party, the, the manufacturer of the airplane would be a party. If it's an engine issue, the manufacturer of the engines would be a party. If it's avionics, then they would be a party. If there's an airport issue, the airports would be a party. So anybody <clears throat> who, who, who has relevant te technical knowledge regarding this accident, we want as parties, because if we find a piece of metal out in, the, out in the field, we have no clue where that piece of metal comes from, but the manufacturer can tell us exactly what it is, and that will help us figure out what, what went wrong because we know where that piece came from. So. So our factual portion of the investigation involves all of the parties for the technical guidance, and, and that's crucial for us to get all the facts because there's no way that our staff would be able to know what that piece of metal is or how the pilots usually do things or how the airport usually operates or all those kinds of issues that you need to know in order to get a full picture of what happened to cause this to go wrong. So that's the factual part. Then, then is the analytical part. The analytical, analytical part is just the NTSB. We do not include any of the parties in that, but we do put, as I said, we put our facts on the, on the website so that they can see it, and we ask the parties, based on these facts, what do you think, what, is, what would your analysis say is happening, and what would you recommend we do to keep it from happening? And we also invite the general public to do that as well. The, pur the purpose of that is obviously so that the actual, the actual report, the analysis on the report is NTSB only so that we don't have any undue bias by any of the parties, because all of the parties, of course, would say the other party caused this accident, not me. But in TSB, we, we have that independence again, that we have no dog in the fight that is so important for us being a world-class agency. <clears throat> so the investigators can be deposed only once, because we don't want them spending all their time being deposed. 
and then only about the facts, but not about the analysis or the conclusion. So again, the analysis and conclusions are not usable in court. So the, the, the law requires us to, when we reveal what was on the cockpit voice recorder, the law requires us to redact the things that aren't pertinent to the accident. So you're not gonna hear, you know, I love you mom in the last 30 seconds before the crash. But so, so there are some laws that affect what we can and can't do regarding the information. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So now, let's talk about some differences between accidents and cyber attacks. The main difference is that accidents are just that. They are, in, they are not intentional wrongdoing. They, are in it, they almost always result from inadvertent error. Cyber attacks, on the other hand, almost always result from intentional wrongdoing. So <clears throat> that's, that makes for a very different environment, which is why one size won't necessarily fit all of this will have to be considered in, in using an NTSB type model. So the objective of the NTSB investigation is not to blame, but to find out how to keep this from happening again. Whereas the investigation on, from, on a cyber attack is gonna to have to determine not only how to stop it from happening again, but also how did it happen this time and, and who is responsible for it. So it's gonna do what in, in aviation would be done by the FBI. So if, we, if we're investigating an accident and we see evidence of criminal wrongdoing, we immediately call the FBI and they lead the accident and then we follow and provide technical support. So that's, that's a very different function. Now we're asking this cyber board to do both of those functions, find the perpetrator and prevent things from happening again. So <clears throat> that's gonna be interesting. Our, the outcome of the investigation is gonna be recommendations to wh whoever can take corrective actions, including regulators. And the investigation is very transparent. Again, the, the data is all public. And the reason for the transparency is that is to encourage public confidence that we are doing it based on the, the facts, the conclusions, and not based on politics. So as I said, when we see criminal activity, we call the FBI. 9-11 is an obvious example of that. And the FBI leads and the NTSB provides technical support. Now let's look at what, what the cyber group is going to have to do. Next slide, please. Cyber attacks are intentional, and that means now you've got two needs, not only to prevent it from happening again, but to find out who was responsible for this one. And that's going to be a very important, that's what the FBI would do for us. That's what we'll have to figure out what's the best way to do that. Because when, when you're looking at finding the perpetrator and you're looking at trying to keep these, these things from happening again, transparency, transparency may not be so desirable anymore because now you may be giving important clues to potential perpetrators on how to hack better next time. So the challenge is how do you develop recommendations for improving defenses without revealing important secrets? And how do you maintain this transparency without revealing important secrets to potential perpetrators? So that is to be determined. We'll have to figure out, I'm sure we can figure it out, but I'm just saying that, that's a way that the NTSB model doesn't quite fit and one size doesn't fit all. Next slide, please. So as Scott mentioned, lots of other applications have asked this question. Healthcare, major, finan major financial mishaps have asked this question. Would an NTSB be appropriate in this situation? The answer is, it depends. That's a good lawyer's answer. I'm a lawyer, so the answer is, it depends. And so the, the, I divide it into two very distinct categories. If, if this is a mishap that is really rare and surprises even the safety experts, then that's when you want an exhaustive NTF, NTSB type investigation to go in great detail into that accident. And that's why the, that's why the accident reports can take so long because they go in very great detail. They don't just say pilot error. They used to back in the old days, but now they go much deeper. As Scott was mentioning, they look at organizational issues. They look at the design issues. They look at a host of issues because the assumption is that if these are good people trying to do the right thing, then the, then the crash probably doesn't mean you got bad people. It means you got bad processes and procedures and equipment. And that's why we want to look at the totality of the circumstances and, and not just pilot error because pilot error doesn't really answer the mail. As to as to what went went wrong, so so I would I would recommend an exhaustive NTSB type investigation for the rare mishap that surprised even the experts. But if it's something that's happening every day, happens frequently, then then there's a system think approach that the aviation community uses called the Commercial Aviation Safety Team that they look at trends instead of individual events and they identify and address systemic issues that those trends that those trends reveal. And that would that's a, a very different machine than than the exhaustive investigation to a specific accident. So NTSB is very useful in some applications, but mostly useful in, or in terms of addressing things that are unusual and that, that confound even the safety experts. Next slide, please. So 
as I say, problems that occur frequently show systemic shortcomings, and that means investigate the trends rather than individual events. So the aviation analogy is the commercial aviation safety team, which is a voluntary government industry collaborative effort to improve safety and has done amazing. I mean, that's, that's a lot of the reason why the, in U.S. aviation, we went for 10 years and carried almost 10 billion with a B passengers with only one passenger fatality. What an amazing safety record that is. And that's largely because of the commercial aviation safety team. Now that process was aided by the NTSB type investigations because then when we see specific issues that need attention, then we identify those in our in our accident investigations. But but those those are the ones that uh, that the NTSB would be as I say if they're unusual and and the safety experts say boy I, that that wouldn't really surprise me then then the NTSB after if it's a systemic trend then you need to use a different approach that looks at the systemic issues that would lead to that trend. So the conclusion, next slide, is one size doesn't fit all, but a lot of the NTSB processes are are very applicable to, to this process, including active participation by the parties. Scott talked about how do you decide which ones to do, and we and the NTSB has to make those decisions as well. So, you know, for example, we do highway crashes, but we don't we only have 420 or so employees in a whole agency. We don't have enough to begin to cover even a small fraction. Of, of highway accidents, so we look. We tend to look at things that involve, say, school buses or motor coaches or tanker trucks or grade crossings. We look at specific areas. We don't look at every highway accident. And recently, we've been looking at a lot of car accidents, which we didn't usually do. But recently, we've been looking at a lot of car accidents because they involve automation issues. And and we're we're experts on automation because we see that so much in aviation. So so a lot of, of what the NTSB does is very transferable. To this activity, but some changes would have to be made because of the differences in the circumstances. So that's, I, I hope we have time to take questions. That's all I have to add at this point on the NTSB, but I'm happy to play a role in helping to make this happen. Scott, back to you. Well, hey, no, thank you so much, Chris. Um, really, really helpful. And there, there's a lot of good questions in the chat, and we're going to try to turn to as many of those um, as we can over the last, uh, you know, five or so minutes. Um, and just kind of scrolling up here, um, one of them that kind of caught my attention was from Crystal. Uh, uh, Chris, I'm wondering if you could speak hey, to Scott. it. Hey, Scott, it's Phil. Uh, I'll just Chris, jump in yeah, really quickly. Uh, yeah, I'll ahead. just uh, help, help you moderate uh, through the questions. We did get a lot of feedback, um, so this is good. Uh, the, uh, the members are engaged. Uh, very interesting uh, presentation. I would like to thank you, Chris, again for your time as well. Um, we did get a lot of questions slash comments in the attendee chat, so I'm going to step through those. I'm going to try to read those aloud for those who are dialed in. Um, it seems that most of our uh, members are actually putting in messages in the attendee chat private to the presenters um, instead of actually putting in the questions um, using the top left icon. Either way, we'll make sure we'll, we'll, we'll get to all of those as well. Um, but I'm just, I'll just step through and help you moderate to get through the questions. Um, it's 12.55 now. I know we're initially scheduled to go to one o'clock, but um, we'll, we'll, we'll happily go over to, to give you guys as much time to, to answer the questions. Um, and hopefully our members will be able to stay on as well. Um, so just stepping through some of the comments, um, our first comment slash question comes from Renee Stott. Um, she says she would love to hear your opinion on the DOD CMMC 2.0 news that just dropped today. Uh, significant changes. Mm hmm. Yeah, I, I responded to that in the chat, um, but so I, I, I'm still waiting through it as well, frankly. <laughs> but as I as I said, I was surprised by the direction they decided to head, just with regards to kind of paring back, you know, the core requirements there, the the kind of shrinking the number of tiers to three, you know, doing away with a third party certification um, if they don't, you know, basically touch controlled unclassified data. Um, and if anything, I would have guessed that they would have, you know, made some of these requirements even more stringent in light of what we've seen recently with the proliferation of some various types of supply chain attacks. Uh, but I get it. I mean, there was a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure from thousands, you know, of different organizations to go this route. So I think as far as the effectiveness, you know, time will tell if this is going to be um, a more, uh, you know, useful and manageable regime than the original version. But I'll, I'll be anxiously awaiting 3.0. <laughs> All right, thanks. The next uh, question slash comment we have is from Gary Stoneburner to NSTB. 
Consider the situation where aircraft type is repeatedly crashing and it is discovered that the type is inherently not airworthy. That is arguably the situation with the IT that is low assurance with regard to withstanding highly capable attackers. And cyber hardening is making it harder, but not hard. Getting more airworthy is quite different from becoming airworthy. So I'm not uh, sure I understand what the question is. Right. I think it was I think it was more of a comment, um, not necessarily specifically a question, but I think he is trying to to make the point that um, hardening your systems does not necessarily make you safe from all attacks, as we do know in the cyber realm. Um, and there is a difference between achieving airworthiness versus taking steps to become airworthy. He was trying to make that parallel. I'm not sure if you guys have any comments based on that. Sure. Well, obviously, I mean, the 737 MAX is an indication of, you know, we, we've had a very successful process for approving airplanes, and that's been a foundation to that 10 years of, of, of 10 billion passengers with only, with only one fatality. But the, the 737 MAX crashes, the, those tragic crashes show that that process is not still perfect. So there, as long as it's built, operated, and maintained by humans, it will never be perfect. And that demonstrated that, and I think that's going to be true in cyber as well. Okay, thank you. Our next comment comes from Michael Altum. Um, within the DOD realm, we leverage independent teams for cyber assessments on a cyclical basis to ensure an unbiased view of NIST 853, um, in quotes, RMF compliance. This third party assessment is critical in ensuring an honest and accurate depiction of risk throughout the system. Uh, that was just more of a comment, not necessarily a question. I'm not sure if you guys have anything to address that specific comment. Um, no, not, not, not really. <laughs> okay, no problem. Um, this next comment comes from Stuart Kowalowski. To your knowledge, how does safety root cause analysis models in the transport investigation differ with root analysis standards and practices in the medical sector in the U.S.? That is to say, maybe the healthcare industry can provide regulators and practice models to cyberspace. There really isn't very much root cause analysis in, in healthcare by comparison to aviation, and that's one of the problems is that uh, we, we don't really have a, a, a good database of causes and a good database of how, how much certain things are contributing to those, those causes. That's, that's one of the, the uh, shortfalls in, in healthcare is, is that the, the aviation industry depends very heavily on information about things that went wrong and things that almost went wrong in order to make itself safer. That information is not to, the, to, to anywhere near the same extent collected or used in healthcare. So that's, that's one of the issues in, in healthcare is the, is the lack of data and, and the lack of knowing exactly what caused the problem. Okay, sounds good. Uh, Stuart actually uh, expanded on that and said, to my last question, what is different or similar to the National Patient Safety Board and the National Transport Safety Board in the U.S.? Um, I think you kind of touched on that already a little bit. Correct. And I've been asked to talk about the National Transportation Safety Board to the people who are looking at the National Patient Safety Board. And I think it's a great idea, but same comment. It's going to be more effective for highly unusual things that confound the safety experts as opposed to trends which need to be addressed in another way that, that the aviation industry is doing through the commercial aviation safety team. Thank you. Our next question comes from Crystal Kamiski. The NTSB statistic that 80% of recommendations are implemented despite not being mandatory is fascinating. This seems to be a result of NTSB's credibility and structure, such as independence, litigation separation, broad public awareness, et cetera. And a cyber board could implement those same measures to achieve a similar level of recommendation implement implementation. My question is, what are the obstacles to capturing the remaining 20% for both NTSB and a potential cyber board, such as implementation costs, lack of clear federal policy standards, et cetera? Well, part of that, as I mentioned in my presentation, part of that 20% gap is because the NTSB is a safety only agency by, by design. Their, their idea is what would you do in your ideal safety world if safety were your only consideration, but since it isn't, then that means we know in, in the real world 100% of our recommendations are not going to be followed. And as I said, if they if 100% of them were followed, I'd be worried that something isn't quite working the way it's supposed to. 
Understood. Uh, Renee Stock has a comment. I have an idea that the shame should be used as a backstop to fund good behavior, much like the Defense Base Act, workers' comp for Oconus travel of employees. The Fed government, the federal government, reimburses for increased risk. Uh, that was just specifically a comment. I believe Scott addressed that in the attendee chat. Um, Jerry, the slide deck will be made available. Um, you will be able to find that on the CSI web, uh, csiorg forward slash webinars. When you find this webinar, you'll be able to click and get a PDF version of this. And as well, within a day or two, uh, recording of this presentation will be on our YouTube page as well. Um, and we do have one more question. How would NTSB approach cybersecurity where the 737 MAX situation is the norm rather the exception? I'm not sure I understand the question. So I, I, I'm not sure exactly either, Chris. I think I think you might be referring to, Gary in this case, might be referring to the, uh, um, just like basically the, the prevalent, you know, cyber insecurity, the design flaws, um, hardware, software, corporate governance issues, basically just, you know, the fact that there's, you know, top to bottom, a lot of issues that need to be addressed, but which kind of gets me back at least to the triage discussion we had earlier, figuring out, you know, where to put our limited resources, especially investigatory resources here. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure it, I could be coming at that from a wrong vantage point. I, I think those are legitimate debates to have about what thresholds and, you know, what, what the low hanging fruit are that we want to focus on to begin with. Um, or for that matter, just jump to the top of the tree, right? Really just focus on the most devastating novel, you know, attacks. Uh, but I, I'm sure you have other insights about the 737 MAX, you know, Chris, I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe there's another aspect to this that I'm missing too. Yeah, the 737 MAX was a fascinating case and it was it was a confluence of lots of, lots of issues. One of which actually was, in my opinion, Complacency and complacency when things get very, very safe, as I talked about 10 billion passengers with only one fatality, that's very, very safe. When things get very safe, complacency rears its ugly head because people say, oh, we got this one figured out. We don't need to take care of it anymore. Safety is not a destination. Safety is a continuing journey. And that's going to be true, certainly in cybersecurity as well. That there is no destination there. The, 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 the objective is continuing improvement because you never reach it. You'll just get better at it, but it'll never be perfect. So, so that's that's what certainly what the tragic max crash has taught us. Thank you for that answer. And I believe we have addressed all questions and comments. Uh, we actually did get another comment from Michael um, Altum. Um, we do not, unfortunately, have a second webinar scheduled uh, for this same topic. Um, but I do encourage you to reach out um, directly to the presenters, or if you would like to uh, run that through CSI Act, then we can as well. Um, we also um, like to take this opportunity to promote our technical inquiry service. If there's specific questions that you do guys that you do have uh, related to DoD research and engineering, we do have a technical inquiry service where we can help you get a, a jump start on some of those uh, research questions. But uh, by all means, feel free to reach out via e email. Uh, directly to the presenters, or if you would like to run that through me, um, then by all means, reach out. Um, but with that being said, I would like to uh, thank Scott and Chris. Uh, actually, before we wrap up, we just got one more question. Okay, we have a, a, a rewording of the question from Gary. Um, the 737 MAX occurred in a place where it is rare and such a situation is rare. How, sh how should we approach an area where it's not currently safe and we have yet to get there? The idea of high reliability organizations depends on a number of factors, including uh, uh, being aware of weak signals and responding to weak signals so that, so that if you've got a clue that something is heading in the wrong direction, jump on it quickly rather than wait for it to ripen to a, a real mishap. And there, there were the, the 737 involved a, a, an evolution of a fairly weak product to a much more aggressive product. And in, the, in, that, ev in that evolution, a, a lot of weak signals were missed that, that things weren't quite right because one of the eye rolling questions that everybody had after the, you know, after, in hindsight was, 
how did this very powerful system end up relying on only one sensor of information to, to base its decisions on? And that, that's an excellent question because the FAA has, has a, a hierarchy of the number of sensors you need based on the, the, the aggressiveness and the, and, the, and the importance of your system. And so that wasn't followed and there are lots of questions on why wasn't that followed? And so that's just one example of how weak signals were not paid attention to appropriately as they need to be in something as complex as that. And and again, I I base that on complacency. And it's also very the they were talking about delegation process allowing Boeing to approve some of the aspects of this of its design. And that delegation process was very bureaucratic and complicated. And I think that bureaucratic complexity undermined some communication so that the people who needed to know those facts didn't necessarily know those facts and that that was part of the reason why that airplane was approved with a system as unacceptable as that. Thank you. Uh, with that being said, I believe we have addressed all, all comments and questions today. Um, very interesting topic. Um, we had a very engaged audience today. I would like to thank Chris and Scott for presenting today. Um, I'll turn it over to you for any uh, closing comments that you may have. I would just like to thank you for inviting me. This has been fascinating and I've enjoyed it thoroughly and I look forward to working further with the cyber community to see what lessons they can learn from what we what, what has worked so well for us. Completely agree. No, just thanks so much again for the opportunity and, and please do reach out uh, with any, any questions or hopefully we can have a follow-up when this uh, Cyber Safety Review Board at least is fully staffed and ready to go. Thanks again, Phil, for all your help. All right. Thank you. Uh, that concludes our webinar uh, for this month. Uh, we will see you next month. I believe our next webinar will be December the 7th. Uh, thank you. Thanks. Thank you.